Okay, I think we seem to be stabilising a uh, number of participants. So welcome to the last lecture of this unit. Um, we're, this is the fourth of our lectures on welding and today we're going to look at how to make sure we can assure the integrity of a weld, how we can make sure that a weld does in service what we want it to. Um, just some housekeeping before we start. I'm sure you're all aware that the second quiz is at nine o'clock on Friday. Um, the other thing to remember is there is a final drop-in session tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Uh, on Zoom if you need to ask any questions about the content of the forming or the welding lectures. So that's six or seven tomorrow evening. Um, and you've got the second quiz covering polymer processing, forming and welding on Friday morning. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? Integrity. Well, we're gonna start off by looking at something called residual stress, uh, which you may not have encountered before, but which is a real problem in welds. And also we're gonna have a look at distortion uh, very briefly which is something that we don't want when we make a weld in general. We're then going to look at post-weld heat treatment, uh, which I alluded to yesterday, because one of the things we do post-weld heat treatment for is to improve the toughness of a weld, particularly a weld where you may have formed some martensite by cooling the heat affected zone too fast during the welding process. We're then going to look at the sort of defects that we can form in a weld. Um, we mentioned that very early on in the first lecture, the sort of things that might go wrong, like inclusions of slag from a flux based welding process. And once we've had a quick look at weld defects, we're going to then have a look at the methods we use to find them. That's non-destructive evaluation. We're then going to look at methods uh, we use to destructively test welds to prove that they have the mechanical properties that we might want. And finally, we're going to look at the paperwork, uh, which sounds boring, but was actually quite important. We're going to look at what's called welding procedure qualification, which is how you ensure that you design the weld right. You get the right welder to make it in the right way with the right materials. Um, quite important, even though it does look like paperwork. OK, and we'll summarize. So. Let's start off with a look back into the past. Now, I expect many of you have seen that photograph before. It's extremely famous. Um, that's a Liberty ship. Uh, I think it's the SS Shenakdadadi or something like that. That broke in two in harbour one cold night. I think they all went to bed and the following morning the ship had broken in two. So Liberty ships were a very early large scale use of welding. Um, there were something like 2,700 of them launched. They were designed to be built faster than submarines could sink them in the North Atlantic so you could continue to supply war materials and food to Britain from the USA during the Second World War. And as I said, it's a very early large scale use of welding. And this is shielded metal arc welding. You remember stick welding, the first one we looked at. Basically, you can make these things much quicker if you weld them than if you rivet them together from plates. Of that 2,700, about 400 of them suffered cracking of one sort or another. There were something like 90 serious fractures 20 quote complete failures. Now I think that one there you can see on the right counts as a complete failure. Um, and only 12 of them broke in two, completely broke in two. So that's a good thing, isn't it? Only 12 broke in two. Now many of the cracks in these started at welds. And this was down to a poor choice of material. Um, I think they had a steel which was actually prone to forming brittle phases in the heat affected zone. Um, it was down to weld residual stresses because that's an inevitable consequence of welding, as we shall see, unless you take steps to remove them after welding is complete. And weld defects, 
all the nasty things you can find in your world if you don't make it carefully and then inspect it carefully afterwards. So that was the Liberty ship. And even with those many failures, of course, they were deemed to be a big success because they were even, <clears throat> even with those problems, they were able to build them faster than they could be sunk. They could move material around. And apart from maybe being on those 12 ships that broke in two, uh, everyone deemed them a success. So residual stresses. What is a residual stress? Well, here's a definition. It's a stress that remains in a body when it's stationary and at an equilibrium with its surroundings. That's one definition. Um, what we're saying is normally you associate with stress, stress with putting a load on something. If you load a beam, you'll generate a bending stress in it uh, in order to maintain equilibrium with an externally applied load. Uh, if you do a tensile test, you put a tensile stress on something. If you do a bulge test, uh, which you remember from deep drawing, I'm sure, you pressurize one side of a dome, blow that dome up, and the, the stresses inside the material react against the external load. If you remove the external load, the stresses disappear. Um, so the residual stress is not the same. Uh, you can have a component with a residual stress sitting on a bench with no loads of any sort on it, and it will still have stresses inside it. Um, and residual stresses are caused by what we call misfit strains, localized plastic deformation. Um, and they can arise through either mechanical deformation such as rolling or forming. You can do it due to non-uniform heating or cooling uh, during fusion welding. And what actually happens is you stretch one part of the component plastically. You get the loads above one part of the component above yield, so it permanently deforms. And then when you take the loads off, you find that that bit of the component no longer fits into the hole that it would have occupied before you loaded the component. And as a result, it's squashed or pulled by the rest of the component around it that wants to return to its original shape. And you set up an elastic stress field due to plastic misfit strains. And I'll show you how that works in a moment. Now, one of the things you know about residual stresses is it because if they exist in the absence of any external loading on a body, they must be self-equilibrating over any plane within that body. If they're not self-equilibrating, then effectively there's a net load, and that means your body must be accelerating somewhere if it's not got any other net load on it. So residual stresses, no external load, self-balancing across any plane within the structure, and caused by plastic misfits. A classic example of a residual stress field is the children's toy, where you bang a wooden peg into a hole that's slightly too small for it. And banging that peg, peg in causes the air, material around the hole to expand, to go into tension. You're pulling the atoms apart. And the peg you're bashing through, making smaller than it wants to be, is put into compression. And that's an example of an elastic residual stress field. Um, if it were plastic, a permanent deformation, the first time the baby knocked it through the, um, knocked the peg in, uh, it would deform it permanently, and then it would fit in and out without any trouble. But that's an example. I'll now show you a slightly more complex example, which shows you how a well residual stress field develops. What we've got here is something we call the three bar analogy. You've got three metal bars, and those metal bars are attached rigidly to two restraints, one at the bottom and one at the top. So those restraints cannot deform in any way. Uh, so if the restraint moves up in the middle, it moves up the same amount 
on the outside. It's rigid. This is a, a thought experiment. It's rigid. Uh, it ensures that the deformation, the length of all three bars is always the same. So the bottom restraint never moves. The top one can move up and down, but it moves up and down the same amount at the top of every one of those three metal bars. Now those metal bars, of course, show a stress strain response like the one we saw in forging where you have an elastic portion and then a plastic portion. So let's start heating up the middle bar. Now, if you heat up a metal, it wants to expand. You generate a thermal strain in it. So that middle bar starts to expand. So it starts to push against the restraint. Now the restraint can move. It can move up because that bar's pushing against it. But if it does so, it pulls on the two outer bars, because remember, the length of all the bars are always the same. So this middle bar wants to be much longer than it originally was because we've heated it up. So what actually happens is you end up with the same displacement at the tip of all three bars. The middle bar is being pushed down into compression elastic compression. So if you remember, if you have an elastic stress, you have a strain that's proportional to that stress and the proportionality co constant is Young's modulus and the outer bars are now in tension. So basically the whole thing is moved up a bit. It's moved up less than the middle bar wants to go. So the middle bar be is being pushed down into compression elastically and the outer bars are being pulled up into tension elastically and the total net load is zero. So the compressive load on the middle bar is twice in magnitude the tensile loads on the outer bars and opposite inside. So that's just elastic. If we took the temperature field away at that point, then we remember that elastic deformation is always reversible. So the thermal strain disappears and the elastic strains disappear too. So the bar, all the bars shrink to their original length. Um, and in the center, the compressive stress disappears because you have taken away the thermal strain, trying to make it longer than it wants to be. And in the outer bars, the tensile strain disappears. However, if you heat it up beyond the point at which it yields, in other words, the elastic strain exceeds the strain at the yield strength. So the thermal strain is greater than the yield strain of the material. You start putting plastic deformation into that center plate. It's still in compression because it wants to be longer than it actually is. It's being held by the rigid bar and the two outer bars are in tension because you have to have load equilibrium. There's a tensile load at the end of each of these bars. So that's still an elastic tensile strain pulling them up. This one here has actually now got a tensile thermal strain, a compressive elastic strain and some compressive plastic strain as well because you've loaded it beyond the yield point. So some of the strain that's going in to counteract the thermal expansion is actually now permanent compressive strain because you've changed its shape. So you've now got plastic deformation, compressive plastic deformation in this middle bar. If you then take the thermal field away, all the thermal feed strains disappear, but that plastic compressive strain doesn't, which means this bar now wants to be shorter than it originally was. And of course, what actually happens is you have to pull it out a bit to fit onto the rigid restraint, and that generates a tensile stress at room temperature, and that has to be balanced by compressive stresses in the two outer bars, which are therefore squashed a tiny bit in compression.
So there you have a thermal mechanical or a thermomechanical residual stress field. You've heated it up until it yields in compression because it's being squashed as it tries to expand thermally in order to fit everything together. When you take the thermal strain away, you're left with a permanent plastic misfit strain, which makes this bar want to be shorter than it otherwise was. When you fit everything back together again, you've got tension in the central bar, compression in the outer two bars. And that is an analogue for how a residual stress field develops in a world because you have a big temperature gradient there. So if you carry that three bar analogy in your mind now, let's now look at what happens in a weld. Here's a single pass butt weld. So what do we know about that? Well, we know that the weld metal reached 1400, 1500 degrees centigrade and was molten, so no thermal strain there. The material around it, the heat affected zone, got very hot. So that'll have a large positive thermal strain in it. But this material out here did not get hot. So it had a much smaller positive thermal strain in it, which means that this central bit, the heat affected zone, wants to be much longer than it's restrained to be by the plate outside. And of course, when this weld metal solidifies, it solidifies at a given length, but at 1500 degrees centigrade. When the whole thing cools down, you get a negative thermal strain in the weld metal because it actually contracts as it cools. And of course, the heat affected zone also contracts as it cools. And because it was restrained by the plate on either side, it actually already had plastic deformation in it, just like that three bar central bar. So you end up with the weld and the heat affected zone actually want to be shorter at room temperature than the plate outside. And that's because they got much hotter. Therefore, there's more thermal strain to disappear when you cool the whole thing down to a uniform temperature. And as a result, the sort of stress field you get is tension. And you're looking along the world here, a longitudinal stress coming out of the page at you. Tension in the weld bead and the heat affected zone on either side has to be balanced. So it's balanced by compression in the parent material out on the edges. If it wasn't balanced, it wouldn't be in equilibrium. The thing will be in orbit. Um, and because this zone is much, tends to be physically smaller than those two zones, what you see is that tensile stress is much higher than those compressive stresses out in the plate because this acts over a much smaller cross-sectional area and it has to be balanced. So that's a single pass butt weld, quite a simple weld residual stress. Now they can get extremely complicated. This is an example of a weld laid into a groove. So rather than butt welding two plates together, this diagram is a cross section of a plate and it's got a groove machine in it. And you fill that groove up with one, two or three weld passes. And you can get extremely complicated stress fields. So this one here, you see it's the red is tension, blue is compression. This one, you've got tension underneath the weld, compression inside the weld and compression elsewhere. Now, there are reasons to do with metallurgy for that. But the message from that just is that residual stress distributions can get complicated. But the basic principle is the same. It's a plastic misfit caused by temperature gradients during the welding process. And it can be visualized via that three bar analogy or by thinking about what happens to something like this simple single pass butt weld. OK, now residual stresses can be a problem. Uh, they can be very large. They can have magnitudes comparable to the yield strength of the materials being welded because you tend to get plastic flow during the development of residual stresses. So you end up with stresses on the yield surface approximately equal to yield. And in fact, in a thick section weld, they can be much higher than the yield stress of the material. 
and that's because you're generating a three-dimensional uh, state of stress and I think this is something you haven't covered yet but take it from me if you have stresses in all three directions what you find is the individual stress components can get much higher before the component as a whole starts to yield so residual stresses in thick section wells can be bigger than the yield strength of the material now if you bear in mind that design codes try and keep the operating stresses due to pressure, gravity, train loads, winds, whatever, try to keep those operating loads less than about two thirds yield at maximum, um, then uh, having a stress field that goes up to above yield can be a problem to you, particularly if it's one that's actually apparently not doing anything for you because it's not the load you're designing it for, it's something you've put in during the manufacturing process. You could also, another problem is if you have a well with lots and lots of cycles, you work harden the material around the weld because every time you lay a well bead down, it gets hot and it gets cold. It goes through another loading cycle of compression during heating and tension during cooling. So you can generate work hardening, cyclic hardening in the heat affected zone. And that means it can sustain even bigger residual stresses. So you find that you think the yield strength of your stainless steel is 300 megapascals. Well, right on the edge of the weld, it could be 450. Question from Alex. Um, hello, sir. Uh, I have a question. Does this mean that the basically the stresses around the vicinity of the weld can basically take are more brittle? Well, stress and brittleness are not the same thing. No, but if you work harden, doesn't that make it? It can do, yes, yes. It means the material can potentially become more brittle. Okay, um, and does, yeah. it, does it become more brittle? Like not in the, like not ne like next to the, the heat, I don't know how it's called, the HEC, I think it was called? The Heat affected zone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Does it make it more brittle? That, um... It depends on the material. So, okay. yeah, it does depend a bit on the material because some materials cyclically harden and some don't. So the one I was mentioning is stainless steel, the sort of thing you make um, well, cutlery out of. You make much more expensive things than cutlery out of them. Uh, stainless steel does cyclically harden, which okay. means its yield strength goes up as you approach the weld. Um, but the converse to that is stainless steels are very tough normally. So right. it usually doesn't get you into trouble. A, a carbon steel, um, which of course can form martensite in the well, in the heat affected zone if you're not careful, which is brittle, tends not to cyclically harden very much when you weld it because it, it, it's hardening behavior, it just isn't like that. But you're right, if the yield strength goes up, all other things being equal, the toughness tends to go down. Okay, got it. thanks. Okay, right. And so residual stresses are genuinely a bad thing. And that will bring us on to the next thing we talk about, which is the fact that we often need to try and get rid of them. And um, we usually get rid of them with something called post weld heat treatment, because that way we can potentially avoid problems with other degradation mechanisms when we put it into service and metal fatigue or stress corrosion cracking are mentioned there. Another thing that all this does is put distortion into a weld. Uh, remember we, we talked about this briefly with the fact that electron beam wells don't distort very much. So you get localized shrinkage, you get plastic deformation, which means that the the whole thing doesn't fit together elastically anymore. And that means its shape changes. And that can be very undesirable. Um, the material around the welded joint deflects or distorts in order to minimize the strain energy in the material. And you end up with distortion. Now, welding engineers can manage distortion to some extent by restraining a component during welding which means that the, the plastic deformation then goes in during welding in such a way that when you release the restraints at the end of the welding process, it doesn't spring back elastically very much. 
Um, so distortion is a function of the restraint in the structure. Um, if the restraint is significant, if you, what people sometimes do is weld your weldment down onto a base plate before welding it up, uh, you get a lower distortion, but you'll probably end up with higher residual stresses. Um, and you have to make sure that distortion is not excessive. There are lots of ways you can do this. Um, here are just some simple examples of how you make the weld. So a single pass weld, which has been made from one side, tends to deform like that. We call it butterfly distortion. And the reason for that, as you can see, is there's much more weld metal at the top than at the bottom. So near the top, there's a higher volume of material that's got very hot than near the bottom. So when it all cools down to room temperature, the top contracts more than the bottom. So you end up with this distortion that's called butterfly distortion. Now, you can actually, with an arc weld, you can minimise that by doing a two-sided weld. And here's an example of a two-sided weld. You do one weld pass on one side or a series of weld passes on one side, which tends to crank the butterfly distortion towards that side. Then you put some more on the other side, which tend to ratchet it back again. Um, so you end up with much less butterfly distortion, but you still get transverse shrinkage. And of course, as we mentioned a lecture or so ago, a single pass keyhole weld, a laser weld or an EB weld, because it has a narrow and constant width uh, weld zone, that means the zone that gets hot is smaller than on the arc weld on the left, and it's much more uniform from top to bottom, which means the thermal contraction overall is smaller, and the difference in thermal contraction between top and bottom is less. And so you tend to get transverse shrinkage only. So there's some examples of distortion. When people are manufacturing big welded frames, they sometimes work very hard to work out the optimal sequence in which to weld the bits of the frame together, where to put the welds are, in order to minimise the total distortion at the end. So if you're welding together the frame or the chassis for a big excavator, if you sequence the welds correctly, there will not be very much distortion at the end, which means you don't have to do any rectification before you put the cab and the hydraulics and things like that on it. Um, so distortion can be a big problem, but there are ways around it. Um, and this mentioned the very, very simple one that you can reduce butterfly distortion by using a double sided weld or using, if it's appropriate, using a keyhole welding process. Post-weld heat treatment is the next thing I want to talk about. Um, now, many steels that you buy from a steel mill have been heat treated. Um, they've been heat treated to optimize the strength and the toughness. Um, typically, they are a steel will be what's called normalized, which means it's austenized, taken up so it's full austenite, then it's quenched to form probably a bayonetic structure, and then it's tempered where it's heated to a temperature which allows any brittle phases to basically convert to less brittle bayonetic phases. So martensite transforms to ferrite and cementite in a precipitate distribution, which is better than just plain martensite. But the take home message here is that a lot of steels you buy from a mill have already been heat treated. Um, and this test, what I've just said, is the quenching stage of that heat treatment usually produces martensite, which is hard and brittle, and then you temper it to, to, to convert it into something that looks a bit like bayonite. So it's a ferrite matrix, not body centered tetragonal, tetragonal, and it's got iron carbide precipitates distributed through it. Um, now, if you weld this sort of steel, then as we saw yesterday, even when you're careful, you could end up with martensite in the heat affected zone or some other low toughness microstructure. One we mention here in this course is martensite. And you don't want that to go into service because if you've got inadequate toughness in the heat affected zone, 
then your weld might not perform appropriately in service. It might, you could, you're at risk of brittle failure in service, which is not something you want to happen. So post weld heat treatment is a generic term for any heat treatment that you perform after the completion of welding. Um, and very often steel welds are post weld heat treated at temperatures between 550 and 780 degrees centigrade. And that depends, the temperature you use depends upon the alloy, the alloying elements in the steel. Um, uh, but it's in that range and that's done to ensure that brittle phases are tempered and uh, you basically achieve adequate fracture toughness in all zones of the weld. Now that has the effect of reducing the residual stresses as well because once you heat a steel up to those temperatures between 550 and 780 you've got it in the temperature range where the degradation the deformation mechanism called creep can take place which means the elastic residual stress distribution gradually reduces because you're converting elastic strain into creep strain the elastic residual stresses are driving creep which means they're gradually relaxing out. So post weld heat treatment has two effects. It reduces, it restores toughness by tempering the brittle phases and it reduces residual stresses. Now, ideally you do this in a furnace because if you put it in a furnace, you can make sure that the temperature of the component is completely uniform at all times. You can control the temperature very easily uh, you can make sure you don't get undesirable temperature gradients anywhere, and this kind of thing. Now, unfortunately, that's not always possible, um, which can cause problems. The other thing you have to do is you have to be careful with both the ramp up rate, the, the rate at which temperature rises, particularly in a large thick component, because you have to conduct heat in from the furnace atmosphere into the component. And if you get too big a temperature gradient while you're doing that across the component, you'll generate more residual stresses. Um, the soak time and the cooling rate, the soak time is basically controlled to ensure that you've appropriately tempered everything, even right in the middle where it might not have got hot until later than the rest of the component. And again, you control the cooling rate to ensure that you don't get either uh, unwanted residual stresses generated during cooling due to non-uniform temperatures, or you don't leave it at high temperatures for far too long and over temper it where you coarsen precipitates and the toughness starts to fall again. So here's some examples. post weld heat treatment in a furnace. There is a picture of a little piece of steel in a furnace at 980 degrees centigrade, which is why it's glowing red hot. Now this is the other side of thing. This is a local post weld heat treatment uh, system. This is probably, it could either be resistance heating or it can be induction heating. Um, basically what you're doing is you wrap blankets and heating elements around the weld part of a component and you heat that part of it up. So you're saying that the bits of the pipe that aren't close to the weld don't need heat treatment and anyway it's far too big to fit in a furnace because it's part of a steam system in a power plant. Um, so we'll just heat up the area we're worried about. Um, now Local post weld heat treatment is fine for changing the microstructure, but actually it often just moves the residual stresses somewhere else in the structure. Because if you look at that picture there, you'll realize you'll have quite a significant temperature gradient between the bit under the blanket and the bit out here. And um, as a result, if you can have significant thermal strain mismatches, so you can end up removing the residual stresses in one place and putting them in somewhere else. Um, so you have to be quite careful with local post weld heat treatments. Um, okay, so that's heat treatment. Next thing is defects. Now here's a cross section of a weld. So this has been cut out, it's been polished and etched, and this is a multi-pass weld in a stainless steel. So if you look at this, you can see the parent material on either side, which is black. 
and you can actually see the individual weld passes. This is a 26 pass weld, I think, which has got four capping passes, which spread out over the top and you can see the surface has been ground after welding because you don't have a weld crown anymore. And there are some crude representative weld defects on there. There's porosity. So if you remember porosity, you can get porosity if you trap gases in an electron beam weld. You can get porosity in a gas tungsten arc weld if you trap the shielding gas. Um, you can get something that's called a lack of sidewall fusion. So you've laid down a weld bead, but you haven't quite melted it into the parent material on the side. So you end up with a gap between the weld and the parent material. Lack of interrun fusion is the same kind of thing. You can get these, de these defects also if it's been contaminated in some way. Slag inclusions, if you're using a flux based process, you can entrain slag in the weld and it ends there. Or lack of penetration defect. Um, so here you think you've welded it all the way down to the bottom, but actually you haven't. You've got a notch at the bottom where the two plates or the two halves of the pipe butt up but you didn't manage to melt the whole of that. So you've got something like a crack running all the way around the inside of the weld. So there's lots of things that can go wrong in a weld. Um, and here's an example. This is that's that same macrograph. And on the left here, we've got a, a core that we extracted from a weld that looks just like that one on the right. So this was actually uh, you drilled a hole and then you trepanned out a cylinder for purposes of measuring residual stress. And this has been mounted and polished because we couldn't work out why the residual stress measurement didn't seem to work. And you can see down here at the bottom, there's a lack of fusion defect, a lack of sidewall fusion defect in that weld at the bottom. So this weld is defective. Um, interestingly, uh, we didn't realize before we did this measurement that the, the inspection report that the supplier had written for us told us that there was a defect in there because they had performed non-destructive examination, which I'll come to in a minute. And they found that there was a lack of sidewall, um, lack of sidewall fusion defect in that weld. So that's a real defect. Now, the defects I showed you on that previous slide are the sorts of things that pop up because you've got porosity, you've got slag, you haven't melted it right for some reason. Now, actually, you can form genuine cracks during welding, during post weld treatment or in service. There's lots of different mechanisms. Um, you don't need to know this, but there are some examples that you might find in the literature. Solidification crack cracking has liquation cracking, hydrogen cracking, reheat cracking, lamella tearing, lots of things that can go wrong. And here is a real example. Um, this is, which you may have seen before, this is a reheat crack. It's a high temperature creep crack in a nuclear reactor steam header. Uh, this has been, this header has been cut off the boiler. Um, it's been in service for 55,000 hours at 525 degrees centigrade. That crack, is about two inches long. Um, it's grown down from the edge of the weld and it's actually been driven by weld residual stresses, been driven by two things, weld residual stresses, which we mentioned earlier, and the fact that the welding process has put strain and temperature into that stainless steel heat affected zone region, which has reduced its resistance to creep cracking. So we formed a creep crack and those were extremely expensive creep cracks because there were, I think, 32 boilers of that design on four nuclear reactors and nearly all of those headers had to be replaced. Uh, and a nuclear reactor of that sort generates revenue of £600,000 a day. So if you have to take it off for six months to cut off the steam headers and replace them with new ones, that's a huge financial hit. So that's an example of a crack in the weld. So how do we find them? How do we stop the weld going into service with defects? Well, we do something called non-destructive examination. Um, the purpose of it is to establish whether a welded joint has got any structural defects. Uh, and you must do that without causing damage to the material. In other words, 
you can't do what we did with that weld I showed you, where you basically cut it up and say, oh, look, I can see a defect there, because that's really not much use to you, uh, because you then can't put the component into service. So very often, NDE is carried out immediately after welding, before a joint goes into service. And you use that to find defects that have been introduced during the welding process. So slag, porosity, these various lack of fusion, lack of penetration defects, hydrogen cracking, which always happens shortly after welding. But you also very often inspect welds when they're in service because bitter experience says that most in-service failures in high value plant start at or near welds. And so design codes like the ASME boiler and pressure vessel code, which is used to certify nuclear power stations, require you to inspect your welds regularly. And that's one of the things that happens during a, the two yearly outage for a nuclear power station is you go around and you have a schedule of weld inspections to perform to catch unexpected in-service degradation, like that reheat crack I showed you. Now, there are a wide range of examination techniques you can, techniques you can use. Uh, visual inspection, uh, dye penetrant testing, magnetic particle testing, eddy current testing, ultrasonic testing and radiography. Now, I'm only going to tell you about the last two, but visual inspection sometimes works. There was a, very, a classic example of a power station in the USA, which had a very, very large corrosion problem. Um, and um, actually, no, I'm confusing that with something else. I'm confusing that with stress corrosion cracking. Uh, it's a pipe weld susceptible to stress corrosion cracking. Um, the classic way people found them was a pile of boric acid crystals underneath the insulation because a leak had started and the uh, primary circuit fluid in the nuclear reactor, which is basically boric acid, had dripped out, uh, evaporated and left the boric acid crystals behind. Now, ideally, you don't want to find it like that. You don't want someone to come along and find something dripping down the back of their neck. You want to actually find it before it reaches that state. Uh, I'm going to say something about ultrasonic testing and radiography. Now, all techniques have advantages and disadvantages. So visual inspection and dye penetrant testing can only detect surface breaking defects. So that's, that's useful, but it's not the whole story. It depends what you're looking for, what you're worried about. Ultrasonic testing and radiography can sample the whole volume. And so they're widely used on critical components. So here's ultrasonic testing, uh, a very simple principle. You pulse an ultrasonic wave into the material. And you, that wave travels from the transducer to the back face and it's reflected and it comes back again. If it encounters a defect, a crack on the way, then it's, some of it is reflected from the crack and comes back. And of course that comes back quicker than the one that's reflected off the back face. So what you get is an extra reflection. This is pulse echo. This is the simplest form of ultrasonic inspection. Um, so you can see that this transducer is uh, firing pulses through the material where there is no defect. That's the pulse. This is an oscilloscope trace. And then a few milliseconds later, you get the echo. And that distance there is based upon that distance there. And if it's calibrated, you know that that distance between those peaks, that time is equal to the thickness of the material. If there's a defect there, you get a trace between the two and the back wall echo drops in magnitude because some of the energy is coming off the crack. And depending on where that echo is, you can work out how deep the defect is, how far below the surface it is. And obviously you can size it by moving the probe back and forth and finding out when the echo disappears. Now, a high level of skill is required to interpret these signals. Um, it can also have trouble with microstructure gradients because if you have texture, remember texture in a weld, that affects the, the transmission of ultrasonic signals because they are elastic vibrations in the lattice. Um, and so if you have a textured material, 
ultrasonics co could be a problem. Um, and they're much better at detecting something like a planar defect than say porosity, because if you can imagine firing the ultrasonic signal at a spherical um, pore or a spherical slag inclusion, only some of that signal will get reflected back. A lot of it will just be scattered and go off in straight, reflect off in strange angles. So it's really good at finding planar defects, but you have to be perpendicular to those defects. So a lot of the skill in ultrasonics is designing transducers and pulse and, and wave paths that allow you to find the defects that you're worried about. And it can get extremely sophisticated. The other side of it is that it's very often automated in order to make it repeatable. Because if you're using a manual operator with a high level of skill, you sometimes get bias and that can have real effects. Um, I was involved years ago in that creep cracking problem where people believed that the cracks were growing because every time the inspectors went back and inspected for the, the same component, the crack appeared to have got bigger and they actually turned the reactor off because of that. Once they had devised an automated mechanized um, ultrasonic inspection system, the crack stopped growing. And that was because the mechanized system wasn't a human being and it wasn't trying harder every time it looked for the same defect. So skill is a real issue here. Automation is actually quite important. But the basic message on this is you're using ultrasonic pulses and you're looking for reflections of things that shouldn't be there. Okay, that's ultrasonics. Radiography is X-rays. Now we all know how X-rays work. It's short wavelength electromagnetic radiation. And you use very powerful X-ray sources to fire them through metal components. And what you're looking at here is if you fire X-rays through a steel component, they are attenuated. And that attenuation tends to be proportional to thickness. If you put an X-ray film on the back, then the darkness, the density of the film, density of the image that's created on the film will depend upon how many of the X-rays get through that component. So over the bulk of the component, you'll say have it gray. Where you have a thinner section, it might be black because more X-rays have got through here. And if you have a void, that means you've lost the attenuation in that void. So you'll see a darker area there. So you can see immediately that X-rays are good at finding volumetric defects. If you've got slag or porosity, that's likely to show up on an X-ray because it has a significant dimension in the thickness dimension, uh, direction, which means it will affect the attenuation um, of um, the X-rays. The other side of that is that if there was a crack per, parallel to the surface, it's very unlikely that you'd find that with X-rays because the attenuation involved in that thin crack would not be very high. If the crack was running top to bottom, then you'd probably see it because you've got X-rays trying to pass along the whole length of the crack, which tends to be a bit wibbly. But a rule of thumb is that radiography is better suited for de uh, detecting uh, volumetric defects than planar defects. And historically, radiography was used much more than ultrasonics. And so you'll often find components made 50 years ago that are still in service. They will have been inspected using radiography. And then for some reason, you'll come back and apply modern ultrasonic techniques to them and you'll start finding defects. And then you have this question, have those defects always been there, but the radiography didn't detect them because it wasn't suited to it, or have they grown in service? So the two techniques are suitable for finding different things and they're often deployed together. The other thing we can do with welds is destructive testing. Um, and that is where you basically do some testing, a physical destruction of your completed weld to evaluate its characteristics. Um, one evaluation technique is the preparation of a macrograph, like the cross section that I showed you earlier. 
Uh, you extract a cross-section of the weld, you polish and etch it so it can be visually inspected. And here's an example of a weld macrograph. Uh, that's that you can see the weld fusion zone and you can see the heat affected zone as well. So that will tell you something about the temperatures that it reached. Um, you can actually polish and etch it to look at the microstructures in the heat affected zone, maybe work out um, what's there. You can often see porosity or slag exclusions or other defects, but clearly that involves destroying the weld and you've only sampled one cross section. There's the fusion zone, there's the heat affected zone, and there's the pair of material. Now you can do other testing as well. They're, they're, the, the welding procedure specifications actually often tell you you need to do tensile testing, bend testing, fatigue testing, creep testing, sometimes fracture toughness testing, depending upon the application of your weld. Basically, how expensive is your component? How many people will it kill if it fails? And um, as those both go up, so the amount of this sort of stuff increases. And now we go on to the paperwork, which sounds boring, but is actually very important. So let's start off with something called a weld procedure specification, a welding procedure specification. This is a formal written document that describes the procedure that will produce sound welds. So it's there to guide welders or welding operators to repeatedly produce welds desired quality. It's the cookbook for making a weld successfully from a particular set of material with a particular procedure and particular consumables for a particular component. That's the weld procedure specification. It includes information on the weld geometry, the weld process, the weld pass sequence, the weld parameters, the current, the voltage, the advance rate, the filler materials, shielding gas, fluxes, pre-weld cleaning, post-weld heat treatment, all those sort of things. It's the cookbook. Follow the cookbook and you'll make a good cake. And that's exactly the same thing for a weld, the weld procedure specification. Now, usually what you do is you perform trials. You test, you destructively test the trial welds. You cut them up and prepare macrographs. And when you're happy, that you are repeatedly, repeat, repeatedly producing sound welds with the right microstructures and the right mechanical properties, you encapsulate that in the weld procedure specification. Now, next one, a procedure qualification record. So what's that? Well, if you've got a weld procedure specification, you've usually got an accompanying procedure qualification record. And this is a record of the welding variables that we use to manufacture a test weld and the details and results of the test that were carried out to qualify the weld procedure specification. In other words, I've taken my recipe, I've made my cake and I've tasted it and it's good. This is basically the document that says this is what we did. We followed this specification to the letter and this is the weld we got and this is what its properties were. And this demonstrates that the weld procedure specification actually produces what you want. Now, you've also then got the welder, the cook. Individual welders are certified through a qualification test referred to as a welder qualification test record. So. The welder qualification test record documents the individual welder's ability to comply with the weld procedure specification and produce welds of acceptable quality. It's the welder's driving test. Okay, you've recruited a welder, he's got qualifications, you want him to make a particular weld for you on a safety critical component. So basically, you have to demonstrate that your welder is qualified to make that kind of weld. And that's what the welder qualification test record is for. So that's the paperwork. It may seem boring, but it's actually vitally important. So summary, as we've now reached five o'clock, in-service failures are very frequent in welds. Um, one of the reasons for that is that fusion welding usually results in the development of substantial residual stresses, and it may lead to the formation of brittle zones in the weld. 
So you often carry out post-weld heat treatment on a steel weld in order to restore its toughness to an appropriate level in weld, heat affected zone and over temper parent material and to relieve the residual stresses. You then very often carry out non-destructive examination to ensure that the welded joint is free of structural flaws like cracks and gas pores. And then you actually have to control your weld quality in the real world by developing a weld procedure specification supported by a procedure qualification record. So that's the recipe and the demonstration that the recipe can make the right cake. And then the welder qualification test record is documented evidence that the individual welder can, can actually follow a weld procedure specification. So it's his driving test or it's his Great British Bake Off competition. So that's weld integrity and that's all I have to say about welds. Thank you.